All right, so we're going to jump into the sermon topic this morning in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning for your presence, how you brought us here before you. Thank you so much for that. But Lord, there are some that are going to hear this message today. Even those that are here in this house, there are still others listening online. They need a special blessing from you, God. And I pray that as we search the scriptures regarding this amazing and wonderful technology, that you will show us what we need to learn, what we need to hear, not just for our hearts. We need that, but also for our households. We need that as well. Help us to live practically these things that we have and use the tools that you're going to give us today. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Keep us and forgive us. Amen. All right, we're going to 2 Chronicles. What book did I say? 2 Chronicles. Now, this is the problem. This is the problem. I just want to let you know, this is one of the fundamental problems with dealing with the house of the Lord. Amen? Here it is. Here it is. This is the problem. When God is done with this device, it becomes a conduit. It gets Filled with something. What does God's house get filled with when it's utilized properly? 2 Chronicles chapter 7. What does it say in 2 Chronicles chapter 7? Let's go to verse 2. Amen. Are you there? Say amen. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 2. What does the Bible say? And the priest could not enter enter into the house of the Lord. Why? Because Because the the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Amen. When God is done with this thing, it fills up. You're not hearing what I'm saying. It's not bloatware. It's not ads. Amen. It's not somebody's rhetoric. Amen. It's not thoughts. It's not ideas or concepts. When it is done, when the technology does what it's supposed to do, it will allow the Lord's house to be what? Filled with anything. Air. With his glory. So here we're talking about God's character is being transferred into the Christian operating system. Are you with me this morning? I'm telling you that unless you have this device in your life, it will be impossible for you to manifest the glory of God. Without this, you cannot be Christ-like. You will fall short unless you learn how to run the house of the Lord. When you do it right, you will get something wonderful, amen? Amen. But the house of the Lord has to be built. Did you know that? Come on on now. Did you know that the house of the Lord has to be built? Do you know it's not a sudden process? Look, turn turn with me to 2 Chronicles. I'm going to just turn over to chapter 8, amen? Mm -hmm. 2 Chronicles again, chapter 8. It's not a sudden process. Notice it takes a little bit of effort. It takes a little bit of time. It takes a dedication. Amen. Notice what it says, and we're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 8 in verse 1. What does the Bible say there? And his own. Amen. So it took 20 years for Solomon, the world's wisest and richest man, to complete the construction of of God's house. Do you think that was incidental or accidental? Do you think it was? That that was just, that's, that's what it was? It was an accident no. that it took 20 years? No. no, you don't think so? I think God has something intentional when he gives us the scriptures. And notice that while he was building the Lord's house, he was building what else? His house. So it is that you can't get your house together while God's house is not together. They go together. Amen? One begets the other. If you will take care of your house properly, amen, then you can carry the principles into God's house. If you will take care of God's house, amen, you can carry those very same principles into your house. Amen? So this work has to be done together. What was the size and magnitude of this work? Let's go to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. Chapter 22, 1 Chronicles, 
chapter 22, and let's see what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14. Let's see what type of investment did it take to build a house to the Lord? If we're going to be serious about this, we've got to count the cost, Jesus said. You don't start building without first what? Counting the cost. Counting the cost. Have you counted the cost of building a house to the Lord? Right. Amen. Or have we entered in haphazardly into this work? Right. We've got to do this thing right. Notice that there was a savings program that Solomon was involved in. And it didn't include just him. It actually included also his father. His father had to be involved in the program. You see, the family has to be on board with this building of the Lord's house. Here it is in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14. What does it say? Now behold, in my trouble, I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold. And a thousand, thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight, for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared, and thou mayest add thereto. Woo! Lord have mercy. That is a serious amount of preparation. Let's get ourselves together. Let's do a little bit of math. Amen. He said, I had 100,000 talents of gold. Now, according to scholars, a, a, a talent is about, by weight, equivalent to 75 pounds. This is 75 pounds per talent, and he had 100,000 of them. Now, if you do, if you do 75, amen, what are we talking about here? Times 100,000, amen, if it was 75,000, that, 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 that would be times 1,000, amen. If it was times 10,000, that'd be 750,000, amen. You, you, you understand where we're going with this thing? All right. But here's the problem. What is it, what is it worth today? How much is gold worth today per pound? Well, I did the math for you. Amen? I know some of y'all are still working on your math. Amen? Here's what it is. In today's money, that is the equivalent of $20 billion. Let me, let me put that in, in a little context for you, okay? So the new World Trade Center that was built, how much do you think they spent on the World Trade Center? Spent well over 100 billion. Oh, 100 billion? Five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. This was just the weight in gold. Now we got another 1,000, 1,000 talents of silver. What is that? That's a million talents of silver. 75 million pounds of silver. People, have you ever thought about this? This is what kind of investment went into building the house of the Lord. Now, I did a little math. That's $2.5 billion in silver. Mercy. Now, come on now, saints. What does this tell us fundamentally before we get started? Before you build a foundation, before you lay the foundation, before you set a pillar or a socket, what does it tell you about counting the cost? Saints, it takes everything to serve the Lord. You can't enter upon the Christian journey cheaply. It requires a resound, significant, multi-generational investment. You didn't get here on your own. Somebody had to pray for you. Amen? Did you count the cost of every time your grandmother had to pray on her knees for you? What was the cost of a spouse dedicating their prayer life, moments of their existence to you? What about your mother? And your daddy, 
What have they poured into your life just so that you can be okay? Last, it was counted, it takes a minimum of $250,000 cash to raise a child in the United States of America. And you think now, think back a little, how much has been invested in us, brothers and sisters, and more and more as the years goes on. But somehow, all this investment is worthwhile for us. But when we come to God, we get a little bit stingy. When it comes to the Lord, we don't want to give everything. We just want to peel off a little bit for God. But what did it mean for Solomon to make this significant of an investment into God's worship? You see, if you want God to show up in your life, you've got to make significant investments. Are you waking up early? Are you talking to the Lord when you don't feel like talking to the Lord? Are you coming to service when you don't feel like coming to service? The Bible says here that behold in my trouble I have prepared. Lord have mercy. Have you gotten it together while you were in trouble? Were you concerned more about your trouble than God's worship? Maybe we got our priorities mixed up and that's why the glory hasn't shown up yet. Have mercy. God is good, though. He went on ahead and got somebody to get it together. So we would have an example. Can you take this principle into your life today? How have you entered into upon building your house? Have you entered into building your house using cheap materials? Look at your relationships, your marriage. Have you used the very best possible? Or have you shortchanged yourself? Lessons from God's sanctuary. I ain't talking today about the collegiate level. I'm just on kindergarten. Elder, can, can we just stay on kindergarten today? All right, we're going to stay on kindergarten today. Have mercy. The investment. Hallelujah. Y'all see this thing? Mercy. Notice what God says here. It, it, it takes some things. Notice, notice. This isn't incident or accident. We want to talk about everything about this, but but the good stuff. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 29. 2 Corinthians 29. I'm sorry, Chronicles. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me do 2 Chronicles 24. Amen. Forgive me, 2 Chronicles 24. Amen. We got two verses there, amen? All right, so we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 4. And it came to pass after this that jo Joash did what? Mercy was minded to repair the house of the Lord. Hello. Anybody with me? Yes, sir. Amen, amen, amen. So what did he do about it? Let's look at this. Verse 8. Verse 8. Look, look, what, look what was done about this. In verse 8, it says, and, the, and at the king's commandment, they made a what? And did what with it? Set it without the gate at the house of the Lord. Have mercy. Have mercy. I want you to see that there is a fundamental principle at work in regards to God's house. God's house requires saving. This means that both the construction and the maintenance require investment. Mm -hmm. yes. Are we together? Yes, sir. That means when you are counting the cost for a house, you don't count the cost of construction alone. Yes, you have to take an additional step and count the cost of maintenance and repair. Yes. Amen. Amen. You can't enter in upon a work 
where it's going to cost you more to maintain it than you can afford. Because if you cannot maintain the house, if you can't repair the house, you won't have a house. Saints, what can we do with this? This knowledge that we are gaining in our practical lives. You want a house? What do you got to start with? Saving. Saints, listen to what I'm telling you. You want a house, what do you have to start with? Saving. Amen. David wanted to build the house. Amen. Couldn't build the house. Had to wait until his son was born. And the son had to save. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then the house was built. Sometimes it takes more than one generation of saving for a house to be built. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. I'm saying in God's worship, sometimes the generations of saints are going to have to cooperate together in order for us to save the house of the Lord. Mercy. Have mercy. It takes something from both generations. Thank you, Jesus. But also, there's going to come a time where we just don't put up and get happy and worship God and come and, and do it year in and year out, and there's no problems and no issues, and we go on forever. No, there is additional work that must be done. Amen. Notice what it says in 2 Chronicles 34. 2 Chronicles 34. 2 Chronicles, what book did I say? 2 Chronicles, amen. 34, verse 10. When you have it, say amen. Amen. And they put in the hand of the who? The workmen. That had the oversight of the house of the Lord, mercy, and they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord. To what? Repair the hands of God. Woo! Lord have mercy. Uh, from time to time, the house of the Lord doesn't just need repair. Repair implies that the original condition was restored. But from time to time, God's house was amended. Meaning that there was an addition put on to the house of the Lord. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm saying I'm way back at kindergarten, saints. I'm not in college with y'all. I'm in kindergarten today. I'm saying, hmm, when we think about what we've got to invest in God's house, we've got to think about the construction of the house. Amen. Amen. We done purchased the house. Hallelujah. But then we got to think about the maintenance of the house. Amen. The repairs of the house. But then we got to think about additions to the house. We might have to amend the house. Amen? So, so when we're thinking about investing in the Lord's house, we need a, a broad-based budget, at least threefold in nature. Hallelujah. Amen. And this is just dealing with the facility. Amen. That's just the, the bounds and the materials that were used in the construction. But there's more. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you today that if you can get an understanding of what investments are required, your prayer life will change. Mm. Come on now. You will stop these cheap prayer saints. Lord, just pay my bills. Lord, just fix my car. Lord, just give me a house. Lord, I need a blessing. I need you to work on me so that I have enough to buy it. I got enough to fix it. I got enough to add on to it. Hallelujah. You need a different level of investment in your house. Amen. When you're thinking about your life, when you're thinking about your body, don't just ask God to just give you what you lost. Amen. Ask God to give you new abilities, new powers, new opportunities, new gifts, new talents. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Expand your prayer life when you understand how you're supposed to invest in the Lord's house. Hmm. That's it, preacher. That's it. That's it. That's it. You know how to do it? Help me out, preacher. 
You know how to you know how to pray this prayer I'm talking about. Where did they do what did they do with all this? Let's turn to the book of Joshua. We're gonna deviate a little bit. Joshua. Joshua. How do we get this together? We gotta get our investment together. They said, but preacher, you ain't even get to the to the actual sanctuary yet. We we way back at budgeting. Hallelujah. Do you know you need spiritual budgeting? Saints, you don't know you need spiritual budgeting. Do you know you may be failing on your Christian construction projects because you have yet to count the cost? You have yet to budget appropriately for these things that God wants to build in your life. Hallelujah. Come on now. By myself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I got it. I got it. I see it. It's for me. It ain't for you. Hallelujah. All right. Where we at? Joshua. Uh, chapter 6. We're going to Joshua chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 24. Now, Joshua was about the Lord's business. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He was out there uh, kicking and tumbling for the Lord. Amen? He was uh, out there doing the Lord's business. Yeah, he, he was kicking tail yeah. and not taking any names. Hallelujah. Yeah. Joshua was given a charge, a job to do, and he was busy about the Lord's business. Yeah. Now, as a result of doing the Lord's business, there's always a reward. Amen? Amen. Let's see what it says. Joshua chapter 6, verse 24. Let's read that. And they burnt the city with what? And all that was there therein. Only what? And the what? And the what? They did what with them? Put them into the treasury. Of the house of the Lord. Oh, now saints. You ain't hear what I'm saying. I'm saying this savings project went beyond David's time. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. What time are we in right now? Mm. This, is, this is way down in Joshua's time. Amen. Amen. Come on, saints. Mm -hmm. Y'all with me? Yeah, I'm with you. What's happening now? He's taking his spoils, and where does he decide to put his deposit? Now, Joshua's a warlord. He's a chieftain. He can go and wage war on villages and nations. And whatever he gets, he can put it in his pocket. And the story would be how prosperous the house of Joshua was. But Joshua had something else in mind. He realized that if I want my house built, hallelujah, if I want my house together, what do I have to do? I got to invest. Where is, where is Joshua investing? Woo, is he invested on Wall Street? Mercy. Mercy. No Wall Street money. No 401k for Joshua. You sure he don't have a mutual fund that he's putting into right now? Joshua said, the place for me to invest for my future is in where? The treasury of the house of the Lord. Have mercy. Did you know that you are in invited to invest in the treasury of the house of the Lord? This is why, in fact, we have officers. The Bible has outlined mm. that there should be people who are given charge over the treasury. Yes. They are called treasurers. Amen? We should treasure the treasurers. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Amen. Amen. Put into the treasury. It's hard to run a house. Huh. Can I testify for a minute? Saints, I've been through it. Mm. It's hard to run a house when you don't have nothing in the treasury. It is tough. Yeah, it's tough. So what are we supposed to do with this thing? We, are, we, we need to have and maintain a treasury. A treasury. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm saying in the Lord's house there ought to be a treasury, but in your house there ought to be a treasury too. Yeah. What, what's the treasury for? The treasury is for the house. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Amen. I didn't say it was for the bills. Amen. We've got to be individually consecrated to saving. 
Hallelujah. Mm, mm. All right, I'm by myself again. All right. Anybody want to think about that? Let's talk about let's talk about this. Now, some people may say see this silver and gold and misapply the principle. So we're gonna clarify. All right. So go with me to Second Kings. Where are we going? Second Kings. We got getting to the wind up here in Second Kings. Chapter 12, 2 Kings chapter 12, we're going to see specifically what God wants us to do. Because we read about that way back stuff, and sometimes we say, well, I don't have no silver and no gold. I can't go beat nobody up and take their money. <laughs> Notice what the Bible says. You get a paycheck. Amen. You get some kind of check from somewhere. Hallelujah. What are you supposed to do? Notice what it says. Where are we at? 2 Kings chapter 12. Let's pick up in verse 4. Amen? Amen. You with me? Yes. Okay. And Jehoash said to the priests, what? All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord. Even what? Of everyone that passeth the account. The money that every man is what? Say that. And what? All, All the money that cometh where? Into their heart. To bring into the house of the Lord. Woo! Lord have mercy. God said, All the money. Now you <laughs> you, you said now 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 elder, you getting me in the, the, the mood of this prosperity gospel thing. Now you're talking too strong about the money. You said, you said we gotta give every dollar. To some pastor named Dollar. No, what I'm saying to you is that you have got to see what God wants you to give. And don't repent. Amen. You know what I'm talking about, saints. Whatever God puts on your heart to give. Amen. Bring all of it. Amen. The Bible said all of it for a reason. God knows our hearts. So he said, all the money. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, so sometimes God puts uh, an amount on our heart. Amen. Amen. But then uh, we get to reasoning uh, with uh, Uncle Sam. And we get to reasoning with Brother Bill. And we start asking ourselves questions about what we want what we don't want. And God is saying, all. The money that cometh into any man's heart, amen, to bring to the house of the Lord, amen. Verse 9, verse 9, okay, so Jehoiada the priest took a chest and did what? Bored a hole in the lid of it and set it where? Beside the altar. On the right side, as one cometh into the house of the Lord. Woo, that's specific. And the priest that kept the door put therein what? All the, All the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. <laughs> Have mercy. Verse 11. Skip to verse 11. And what did they do with this money? And they what? They gave the money, they gave the money being told, into the hands of them that what? Did the work that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they what? Laid it out to the carpenters and what? And builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and what? Verse 14. But they gave that to the workmen. And repaired there with the house of the Lord. Amen. You see that, saints? You see, you see, you see what's going on here? Amen. God has workmen. Are you workmen? All right. Amen. Amen. God has workmen. And this money goes to the workmen. Now, this is interesting. That means you not only got to save up for materials. 
You don't just budget for materials, but to maintain a household may require some outside labor. Oh, let me say that again. Somebody need to hear this today. To maintain a household, you may need some workmen. You may need some outside labor. It means that sometimes you don't have all the skills. Sometimes you don't know all of the arts. You've got to bring someone else in to work for you. But the Bible says the workman is worthy of what? His hire. And so the Bible says we are supposed to save and have enough in savings to pay the workman. It shouldn't be no promise to the workman about what might happen in the future. Amen. We shouldn't be asking God's workmen to do something for nothing in the service of the Lord. It is a false theory that every effort for God must be based on a donation or sacrifice of one's time, energy, or talents. It is more often, let me say that again, it is more often that these works that are done for the Lord needs be compensated. Mm, come on now. We got to add another line item onto our budget. A labor line item. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. I'm saying some of us got it twisted. Some, we do, we do. We still doing too much work. Have mercy. We are failing in our homes because we have not done what's necessary to bring the professionals in to help us out. You ever been overwhelmed with tasks or responsibilities and sunk into depression instead of focusing on what you could do to bring means and save up so you could get good help? Some of God's work is languishing because we don't have good workmen. And God is saying, if you don't have it, buy it. Have mercy. Pay for it, saints. But God is still good to us. Hallelujah. He makes sure we have what we need. So again, add this to your prayer life. Ask God, Lord, is not working. This part of my life is not as it should be. Can you send me a workman? Amen. And by the way, I need you to send me the money. Amen. To pay for the work. Hallelujah. Pray right, saints. You asking God to provide miracles. Sometimes you need to ask God to provide money. Amen. The work can get done that way. Hallelujah. So where are we at? We're asking God to get all this thing together because we've got a new perspective on the level of investment that it takes when you're talking about the house of the Lord. Saints. There are even ministers that we have to think about. Notice what it says. We're going to go to the book of Ezekiel. We're winding down. Yes, Ezekiel 45, verse 4. What book did I say? Ezekiel, Ezekiel 45 and verse 4. Notice what God has going on here. Amen. Amen. Everybody there? Yeah. Okay, Ezekiel 45, verse 4 says, And the holy portion of the land shall be what? Which shall come near to minister unto the Lord, and it shall be what? For their houses, and a holy place for the saints. Ooh. You mean God's ministers are supposed to have houses too? You mean they ain't supposed to be vagabonds and tent baggers? Lord, have mercy. God's ministers need houses. That means even God's ministers have to follow these same principles that we're talking about right now. Have mercy. So they need something. Hallelujah. So that they can save up for what? For their households as well. Lord, have mercy. We got to think about the people that serve in the Lord. How are their homes doing? Saints, this thing about the house of the Lord is serious. 
It even goes into our fourth commandment. Hallelujah. You know that? It's right there. You, you, you know what it says. Yeah. No, well, it says a few things, doesn't it? It's a, you know, we, we repeat it every week, okay? Uh-huh. And the sons and the daughters and what else? Who else is supposed to be resting? Uh uh. The man servant and the maid servant. Wait a second. Hold up. News flash. Seventh day Adventist. It is in a commandment of God that there should be man servants and maid servants. Hallelujah. So that you can give them rest. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You see, you got to get into the business of hiring people so you can get in the business of giving them a break. Y'all hear what I'm saying there? I'm saying some of us are struggling because there hasn't been enough Seventh-day Adventist business owners. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That can provide jobs. Hallelujah. That will allow people to be off on Sabbath. Hallelujah. So they can worship the Lord in, in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. God has us where we have strangers within our gates. Do you know what gates implies? Gates implies land ownership, saints. Woo! Y'all hear what I'm saying? We go back to that scripture we just read in Ezekiel. This is talking about land ownership. Do you know that God's ministers should not be without land ownership? Y'all hear what I'm saying? Do you know why you need ministers to own their houses? Hmm. Saints, y'all don't know? Talking. It's so that they cannot be manipulated financially. Hmm. Think about it, saints. There is freedom in what God is teaching us about the house of the Lord. Now, now, time won't permit me to tell of all the things that are in the house of the Lord. How God wants his stuff with gates around it. Uh, that, that God likes his house with furniture. You know, he, he, he got tables and, and lamps. And, and God has seats. And, and God has uh, baths. And, and, and you know what God has? God has fireplaces and grills. Y'all not hear what I'm saying? I'm saying your God has a vision of home ownership. Hello. Hello. No, no, no. You're not hear what I'm saying. I'm saying the religion of Seventh-day Adventist people is the religion of home ownership. You, 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 you do understand what I'm saying, don't you? you? You know that God wants to establish a house. You know God has a house, don't you? You know that you are uh, of the Lord's inheritance, don't you? You know that God wants to put a place, a sanctuary among his people so he can dwell among us. Don't you know that? See, this whole thing with the Bible is nothing more than a land contract. Oh, go back and read it. Psalms 122 says it this way. Hallelujah. Go there with me. This is our scripture reading. I was glad. I was what? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. All right. Now, why was they so glad? <laughs> you, ever, you ever wonder about this? What made them so glad? If you walked into a $20 billion facility and, and God said, come, come, pray with me, worship with me. This is a down payment on a future inheritance. I'm just giving you a sneak peek of what it's going to be like to be around me. In my house is gold. In my house is silver. In my house is precious stones and vessels of every time. I don't got time to show you in the Bible how it says that God got pots and spoons in his house. 
in God's house, there are drinking vessels and tables and plates where you can sit down and eat with the Lord. In God's house, it says there are chambers, bedrooms for God's people to rest. God's house is a place where we should be glad that we came. But in order for us to be glad to be here, we got to invest in it. And suddenly you will understand the Jewish identity problem when Jesus said, not one stone shall be left upon another of this house. They were hurt. They were devastated. This huge artifice, this central place of worship was an example of their prosperity. It was typical of their faith. It was saying one day God was going to come down to this world and rule from this very throne. And they were going to be his subjects first and favored among the world. And then Jesus comes and says, there is one greater than the temple that's here. <laughs> dashing their hopes and saying, you didn't listen to me. It isn't a house. It's the house of the Lord. Jesus said, how are you going to swear on the temple? Isn't the one who is the owner of the temple greater than the temple? Saints, we've got to look at this thing from a kindergarten perspective. Now, today, we only were able to dive into the budget. But again, time would forbade me to tell you of the labors and the shovels in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. How, how there were servants that their job was to clean the house of the Lord. How there were other servants in the house of the Lord whose job it was to watch the doors. To make sure nothing unclean came into the house. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. You're not hearing what I'm telling you about there being governors of the house of God. Yes, there were governors to the house of God. We know about the ministers, but did you know the ministers had breaks? Mm. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh-uh. Go back and read this thing about courses in the Bible. Mm. There were vacations mm. in the house of God. Amen. There were days when the house had to be cleaned. Mm. Where every corner they had to go and pull the refuse out of God's house and put it in piles in other cities and burn it. Mm. They sanctified the house of God. Time would prevent me to tell you of the music in the house of God, how they use cymbals and psalteries and harps and trumpets in the service of the house of God, how stringed instruments are part of the future of God's worship. Time would omit for today for us to talk about the richness of what it means to get to God's house. That the promise is that one day we'll be able to get there and do everything we wanted to ever do in the house of God. You have a small projected image of the house of God in your mind. I just want to fix that before we go. The image in your head of God's house is too small. You see, the, the awesome 20 plus billion dollar facility that was erected on this world. Uh, for a house for God. God refers to that as <clears throat> my tent. Now, if a $20 billion blazing, dazzling, awesome, magnificent building is your tent, what is your house like? Saints, you're not getting it. We ain't going to get saved and go to the tent. We're getting saved to go to the house. We're going upstairs. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We're not going to stay downstairs. We're going upstairs. God's got a place where in order to enter into the precinct thereof, not even the angels can enter without a golden car. You see, when you enter in, when you break forth, when you move from this realm to the next realm, it has a whole nother salutation. Over there, when they see each other, they don't say hello. Over there, when they see each other, they say, bless it. See, that's how you introduce yourself to people. That's how you pass people by. That's how you wave to people in heaven. You say, bless it, bless it, bless it, bless it. That's the whole place. But it's filled with light. In fact, the place is called by our prophet a realm of light. That means there is no shadow in this realm. 
That means if you go to one side and then the other side, it's equally as bright on every side. There's no shadow in this place. When you go to this place, there is only joy. In fact, people are so joyful, they spontaneously form choirs. They get together, Spirit of Prophecy says, in perfect squares, in, in set amounts of chords. And they do this square within square. And it's a, it's a harmonious event. And the Spirit of God manifests himself in the midst, just right there. And there's places you go when you're up there and all you hear is holy, 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 holy. It's like a march. It's like a, an anthem. It's a peace. It's a pace. It's a heartbeat. Holy, holy, holy. This is where you're entering into. Jesus said, I'm not even ready yet for you. What do you mean? That place ain't ready. Please just let me in the door. Lord have mercy. No, I've got more. Jesus said, the place is not ready yet. Mercy, I got to go get it ready. You mean a place with endless joy, with bounding redemption, with light everlasting, with peace flowing like a river, with silver and gold shimmering grass, and untold worlds shouting with joy. There's improvement to your house. And you doing it for me. Oh, well, saints, that means I got to go. You can't be stuck on this world, saints. You see, you got to be Adventist about this thing. You got somewhere to go. You've been invited to your father's house. And in his house are many mansions. Now, wait a second. Now, I had to go back. I had to search this thing out. The scriptures say there are many rooms in the Greek. When I looked it up, the Bible says... There were chambers in the house of the Lord that Solomon built. And the chamber itself was a house. Mercy. Think about that for a second. We was wondering what Jesus was going to do. You, you know what Jesus is going to do? He is going to the house of the Lord to install a heavenly condominium of untold price for you to occupy when you come to the father's house I'm talking about when you step out the door people are excited to have you there they shout because the redeemed are there y'all hear what I'm saying they say yes we came to worship it's all right that we came to worship together we've been doing that forever but now among us are the redeemed, the ones for which Jesus died, the ones he paid for. You see, I was glad. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. It ain't talking about that first Jerusalem. It's talking about the new Jerusalem. Amen. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. You know what this implies here? No wasted space. You ever seen those fancy European apartments where they don't waste any space? Or those Japanese apartments where they don't waste? It ma- heaven, God's building mansions that don't waste space. Compact. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Whether the tribes go up. Hallelujah. The tribes of the Lord. Mentioned way down there in Revelation. Amen. Unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are thrones of judgment. Saints, we're talking about this judgment now. Hallelujah. At what point are we going to sit with thrones of judgment? Earl, when is that going to happen? You got to be seven-day Adventist. You got to know what that sanctuary is to unlock that thing, don't you? All right, keep it going. The thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Hallelujah. They shall prosper that love thee. Mercy. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Lord, have mercy. Palaces? This is what we're dealing with, saints. I mean, God has no shortness of resources. Hallelujah. But God is blessing Jerusalem for being Jerusalem, right? No, saints. Let's keep reading what it says. For my brethren and my companions' sakes will I 
will now say, peace be within thee. Y'all not getting it. It ain't about that city. It's about you. Jesus is talking. This is, a, this is a degree, a song of David. It's a graduate degree of David. He's certifying to you. When I got it, I realized it's for my brethren and my companions. This is what Jesus is saying. All this richness, this vast city, this amazing tabernacle, this is for you. I'm secure in peace forever. For you. Some people got into the thing of we got in there and we good. All that's fine. And Jerusalem's a holy city. Mm. I might contend with you on whether or not Jerusalem's a holy city. <laughs> but there's only one reason it could possibly be holy. Verse 9, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy face. Mercy. Did you know that God doesn't want to waste any space? <clears throat> when you look out on the stars and all that's there, can you comprehend its vastness? But our God is a saving God. There is no way there's that much room and there's no plan. You know, when you signed up for this thing, when you heard about this gospel and you decided to give your heart to Christ, you know what you did for yourself? You secured a title to a heavenly condominium. Now, now here's the thing. You can lose your deed. You have ownership in the house of the Lord. But God's not going to waste space. Saints, if we're not willing to count the cost and make the investment and do the work, God will find somebody else's name to put above the door. My appeal to you this afternoon is there is a heaven to gain and you do not want to lose it. Where are you on your commitment to God? Where are you on your savings? Where are you? In your work. Do you need help? What kind of help you need? <clears throat> you need planning? You need some help saving? You need some money to save with? Where you at? You need some work? You need somebody to help you work? <laughs> All these things are available to us through the Spirit of God. They all exist in God's house. We find everything we need right there. My question to you is, are you glad? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your words to us that you have given us a house Lord, a place to be Lord we thank you so much for making this thing practical for us that there is work to do here in this world as well you showed us that it's not enough to have a house up there we also have to have a house here and that house needs to be patterned after your house our goal is simple that when we go into our house we will be glad. And when we come into your house, we will be glad. Lord, until that happens, the glory cannot fill the place. 
So, Lord, show us what we need to do. Talk to each one here. There's somebody here that's holding out on you, Jesus, that hasn't yet committed to your savings program, that's not yet invested, that's holding back work, Lord, that has yet to commit the talents necessary to be able to build a house fit for you. Lord, I'm praying for that person. I'm praying that there's others out there that are hearing this and asking themselves whether they should make a commitment like this and, and where should they make an investment if they want to make one. Lord, we're praying for them, that you will lead them and guide them as to where they should make an investment for you. Also, help us, Lord, not to spend every dollar, but to save as you have shown us. If we need to, help us make a box that has a lock on it and give a key away to another family member or friend and put a hole in the top where we can put the money in, but we can't stick our hand in there and get the money out. Amen. Whatever we need to do, Lord, to be saving for your kingdom. Lord, I pray for every household under the sound of my voice that you will bless them, that you will make your face to shine upon them, Lord, that you will grant them peace, and at the end, they will be found with us glad that they in the house of the Lord. This is our prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and 